Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Loaded Sport, where today we're going to be reviewing the weekend's action. That's including the second round of fixtures in the World Cup group stages, NFL Week 12 and the FA Cup draw that was made at the time of recording, around about an hour before the recording started. Joining me to go through all this information and more is Kemp, Sam and Skin. Hello lads, welcome back. How are we doing? Very good, thank Mr. you. Mr. White, Mr. Dawson, man with the mic, you little cracky you, I want to spread my cheese on you. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never fails. Never it fails. never fails to pop me in. I, I can't wait each and every week or each Something and every to episode to, to, uh, yeah, to find out what he's going to go with. There's going to be some lovely Christmassy themed ones as well, yeah. so keep your eye oh, out nice. for that one. Can't wait for it, can't wait. Aggie, how are you, mate? I'm very good, thank you. Better from seeing uh, the predictions that I made come in. Yeah, we'll we'll mm, get into that, mate. Yes. I know we're we're recording this on on Monday evening for release on Tuesday, as per. I know you've you were a bit you were a game day decision on if you were making the podcast this week. You've been really stuff suffering with the piles again this week, and that you they've come back with a vengeance. How are they at the minute? They're all right, mate. They're under control now, so I'm here and I'm raring to go. Yeah, stood up, yeah. Yeah, obviously, just to make things a bit more comfortable. All good. Days. Let's crack on then. Absolutely. We'll start by looking at England against the USA that took place on Friday. We all had predictions of England walking away with a win. Kemp, I'll come to you first because I know that you're a big fan of uh, using this time to slander Gareth Southgate. Is this going to be the same situation for you after watching that game? Yes, but not in the way that you think. Okay. I think that you expect that I'm going to slam the result. I think you expect that I'm going to slam... Southgate for his tactics, I suppose. And I'm not going to be speaking about it in glowing terms, as you can imagine. But that's not what I'm going to slam him for. So Plot twist. Th- that is a plot twist. And I did say to you before we started recording, a little peek behind the curtain for everybody here. You did. The lads would be surprised at my assessment of the of the England game. And to be fair, I'll take a point. You know, it's wow. very, very rare that teams do get nine points in their um, in the group games. I think we mentioned the stat that only Brazil had done it in recent times. Well, not even recent times, I don't think it is, is it? It's, it's been it's a long ever, time. It? I think it's been a long time, most definitely. I've not got the stats in front of me. But yeah, it's very difficult to win your, 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 your group games and Full get nine seven points. Wins. And I'm, I'm not devastated that we haven't done that. I think we were flat. I think we were poor. But I wasn't as upset maybe as a lot of other people because I wasn't on the same high that a lot of other people were when we beat Iran. Now, we've talked about these rankings, Iran 20th in the world and all this shite. Iran against us were absolutely diabolical. They really were. And against Wales, they looked looked pretty, they looked okay. But Wales are a poor outfit. And I never thought, because we beat Iran 6-2, that, oh, that's it, you know, we look brilliant, we look amazing, you know, it's coming home and all that crap. Because I just didn't buy into it. Iran are what they are they're pretty poor and we and we should have beat them and beat them convincingly and that's what we did so I've got to take my hat off to Southgate and the team on that one but like I say in this game we were absolutely shocking um, from the first whistle to the last we didn't look like scoring there was that Kane chance I think towards the end I can't remember anything else of no happening you might leggy might isn't it really it, leggy it, Kane had just, a really decent chance nine minutes in that went that got blocked for yeah, a corner but yeah other than that bad. just really really bad but again it's a point, and actually, if you look at it, Wales have got to beat us by four goals for us to not go through. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's not the worst result in the world, but it's a very, very bad performance. What I'm really, really fucking pissed off about is, firstly, Harry Kane. Come out in an interview straight after that, he's happy. He's happy with the performance, he's happy with the point. What What's all that about <clears throat> against the USA? Happy. You've then got Southgate coming out. This is a direct quote from Gareth Southgate. Really pleased with how the players applied themselves and controlled the game well. I'm going to go around the room now. Sam, did we control that game well? No, I'd probably say the USA were better side. Yeah, I'd agree with Sam. So USA Dawson. better side. I agree with Sam. So how can we see that and not the England national team manager see that? Might be defending the lads in press. Don't know, but I'm not. Again, I'm not having that. It's, it's a missed opportunity. We could have really put ourselves through into the third game with an opportunity to to play all all the all the guys that probably aren't going to get shot in the knockouts. It's it's the attitude and the response was absolutely shambolic, and I'm I'm not I'm not having that from him, and I'm not having that from Harry Kane either. So that's my biggest gripe when it comes to this game. 
Um, Foda not coming on as well is a is a massive questionable point for me. But again, I said this in another peek behind the curtain. I said this to Sam earlier on in the week in the group charts. I think the reason Gareth Southgate, and it's took me God knows how many years to come to this conclusion, he's so negative and he's so crap at changing things because I think he knows how deficient he is tactically so that if he does change things, he doesn't trust himself to not get as exposed and, and potentially lose a game. So again, not dis, not distraught with the result, but certainly not happy with the performance. And and the after, you know, the, the the press conferences afterwards were absolutely fucking shambolic for me. Yeah, you just mentioned the change there. I've seen mixed reactions on social media. The change of Henderson on for Jude Bellingham, like you've just said there, his, his decision sometimes may seem too defensive. What's your thoughts on on that change? Because I've seen some people say that we needed some experience on in midfield just to try and shore things up defensively. Grealish obviously came on at the same time to add a bit more energy now in attack. Again, like you said, there were no Phil Foden at all, and that was a game that was crying out for a Phil Foden sort of player. Mason Mount won't really turn up to it. So, what do you think to the change of Henderson on for Jude Bellingham? Well, just a quick tidbit and a, and, and a quick another sort of um, bit I picked up on on Southgate's press conference. The reason he gave for not bringing on Foden was that he'd already brought two wide players on. Right now, let's go with that logic from Gareth Southgate. If that's the case, Gareth Southgate rates Phil Foden as our fifth best winger in the squad. Right? That is that is barbaric, and he should be shot for that, to be honest with you. <laughs> and then if you look at it from another point of view, and you say, all right, let's ignore the bullshit in the press conference about him bringing him in on, on as a winger, he said that, you know, he, he's completely ignored the fact that he can play number 10 and he's a good number 10. What does he do for Man City? He, he, he plays against teams that sit in that don't want to concede, and Phil Foden is an expert at opening up them gaps, opening up them spaces, and playing that killer ball that that makes them so dangerous. And Gareth Southgate, for one reason or another, has decided not to bring him on. He's an absolute pillock. And when it comes to, you mentioned Bellingham and, and Henderson. To be fair, I don't like Jordan Henderson. He's, and I say this with absolutely, I'm, I'm not exaggerating this one bit. When he played at Bramall Lane, when I watched Liverpool against Sheffield United, he was one of the worst players I've seen at Bramall Lane in a long time. He was absolutely appalling. He can't pass the ball forward. He looks, he runs like a giraffe. He's terrible. But having said that, in the game against Wales, ultimately, we don't lose by four. We go through. So that experience in the middle of the park gives you maybe a little bit more defensive stability, like you say. I don't completely hate it. You rest in Jude for knockouts, hopefully. You're getting Henderson some minutes. You're getting that leadership in there that, you know, if we go 1-0 down, we don't panic. So I don't hate that too much. But I, I pretty much hate everything else that he said, to be honest. <laughs> Fair enough. And Sam, you had an alcoholic beverage while watching this one. So your original <laughs> uh, your original thoughts may have changed since then. But I'll ask you what your thoughts were on uh, England against USA. Yeah, so I'm glad we're recording it a couple of days after, to be honest, because if we'd have recorded it that same night, I would have uh, been quite harsh and quite aggressive on the matter. But uh, no, I'm very much aware that this episode's going out on Tuesday, so I'm going to be a bit more upbeat and not try and concentrate too much on the negatives. Um, I completely understood the Henderson substitution at the time. I think um, Belling were chasing shadows all game. We just needed a, a bit more of a sure footing in midfield. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna kind of brush that point aside. As Kemp says, you don't you don't win them all, you know. If you win in a World Cup, so we're still top of group. We're still in complete control of uh, of our destiny. So uh, yeah, let's go and approach the Wales game with a bit more positivity. I know of there's rumours that Jordan Henderson starting for this game, which isn't ideal. But if it is for the same reason reason I've just mentioned that he doesn't quite trust Bellingham enough to run the game, then I've got no problems with that, to be honest. Skin, your thoughts of the potential team selection into the game against Wales from the game that's just been played against USA? <sighs> nice. Did, did the mic pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my thoughts, mate. It's, no, I completely agree with what the lads have said. Like, It's not necessarily the result that is the issue. Yes, we were expecting a, a comfortable-ish win. We spoke in the preview. I said that I was expecting a, a win by a couple of goals. It's more the performance. It was just... it was. It was just nothing, weren't it? You, I think we played well for maybe the first 10, 12 minutes and then USA controlled pretty much the rest of the game. It was just... 
it was so uninspiring is probably the word that I, that I want to use. And then, yeah, you see the rumours tonight that the likely change or, or the most likely change, if there is going to be one, is Henderson, Henderson start over Jude Bellingham. Is like, yeah, again, it just doesn't get your hopes up that things would be better in 24 hours' time when England are playing Wales. And it also worries me a little bit for the knockouts as well. Ken, I think, uh, Sam, it might have been you, sorry, that mentioned about resting Bellingham for the knockouts and, and things like that. And, no, that was Ken. And Ken. Yeah, and not trusting Jude defensively, and that might be why we're starting Henderson. But, like, I, I saw a very unflattering video of Henderson's game <laughs> against Croatia in the, in the World Cup semi-final from four years ago. And, yeah, it, it, as Kemp said about his performance at Bramall Lane, he struggles to pass forward a lot of the time. He struggles to control games. And, and that was the whole point of having Jude Bellingham in there. He's been absolutely fantastic for Borussia Dortmund. He's he's captain for them and has been for the majority of this season in cha big Champions League games with Marco Royce being injured. Like, yes, he's young, but if he's capable of doing it for that level of side in that level of competition, and he has been praised significantly for his performances... Why can't he do it? Well, not why can't he do it? Because he's shown that he can do it. Like one slow game, one poor game where, let's be honest, nobody other than Harry Maguire really stood out for any kind of positive performance. I don't think it's very good to put the spotlight on a 19-year-old who we have the potential to build this England team around for the next 10 years and use him as a scapegoat for a poor performance when we're now saying, oh, we're bringing Jordan Henderson in for a bit of leadership. There's a lot of players in that team, not not the squad, but that team plays like Pickford, John Stones, Kyle Walker, who hasn't played yet in this tournament, but is expected to come back. Kieran Trippier, Luke Shaw, Declan Rice, experienced players, not just at country, in their country, or for their country, sorry, but at club level as well. It's all well and good saying that we need to bring on the Jordan Henderson to be a leader on the team. But what about the other players that are around that 19-year-old superstar at the moment? Where are they stepping up? Where are they dictating the game? Because... From what I saw on Friday, they went missing, and I don't know why it's Jude Bellingham in his second ever champion uh, World Cup game or his second ever major tournament game for his country is the scapegoat for why we didn't perform the way we did. When a couple of days before in that smashing 6-2 win against Iran, he was one of the main reasons for that. And I think it's a bit of a joke personally, and I think we're looking in the wrong places as to what we need to change. Uh, and Yeah, I think it's very unfair to be put in Jude Bellingham in that spotlight as a bit of a scapegoat. <clears throat> I disagree with you to a bit, a bit of an extent there. We, there, there. There is reason that Bellingham got took off. It, it was it was poor, and I know you're saying to you know they all were. You're right, they were. But he was literally missing assignments. There were people running in behind him that he wasn't picking up, and they were rightfully substituted. And whether or not Southgate's making this decision to remove him from the game for the next one to actually save him from negativity. I don't know if that could be, the, you know, the opposite Possibly. point you're trying to make, but yeah. um, I think he's, he's got to have some kind of accountability. He didn't play well at all. So, yeah. you know. 100%, what... but we talk about defensively, and I know these, the, the lads that I'm about to to mention are, are wingers in Saka and Sterling, but the amount of work that Shaw, Shaw and Trippi were absolutely phenomenal against Iran, but the amount of extra work, they even um, noted it in commentary about Trippi was getting left in, in difficult positions because Saka wasn't doing his role that he has done previously. Yeah. So again, I, look, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that Bellingham had a good game because he didn't. But I think it's very unfair that a lot of the media coverage has been about the poor game that he had. More players that should be held accountable that seem to be going under the radar for their poor performance too. But anyway, but again, that goes down to the game plan, that goes down to the coaching just as much, not just the performance on the pitch. Like I said, I just think it's very unfair that he seems to be the the main highlighted player for the reason why we were so poor. Do you on think Friday me, night? For, for me, there's two. Sorry to interrupt you, Adam, but yeah. for me, there's two schools of thought on it. First of all, is is exactly what you're saying that he's leaving Bellingham out, he's scapegoating him, he's he's targeting him, and if that is the case, you've got to wonder what that does for his confidence. You know, he's played one game, he's man of the match performance or or close to it, and you've got to look at that and think. Jesus, you know, what's that going to do to his confidence going forward in this I, I tournament? Can't see, I can't see that and being the case at I, all. Just, so, so that's the one school of thought. The other school of thought is if you play Bellingham, what, 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 what's, what's harm, what, what harms, what's, what's going to happen? You know, are we going to lose 4-0 against Wales because we play Bellingham? 
Mm, so why don't for me in, in my opinion and, and this is where i sort of tend to agree with dawson more more, more um more than not is play him you know yeah he had a bad performance but you know what you're 19 it happens i believe in you go and make it happen go and build that confidence get an assist get a goal against wales and then get yourself right up it for knockouts again i think he's doing it to to make it a little bit more steady a little bit more sure leadership qualities in Henderson that aren't in Bellingham, even though he has been captain for Dortmund, Henderson has got a lot of qualities when it comes to that that leadership side and not panicking. But for me, I, I do agree with Dawson, like I say, more than I don't, because what does that do to a 19-year-old lad's, lad's confidence to say, actually, you know what, we had 10 players on that pitch who were absolutely shy and we're going to take off a 19-year-old who had the, the, the best performance in the, in the week before, albeit against Iran. So, for me, I don't agree with it. I sort of get it on one respect, but what effect is that going to have on that on that young lad? You know, I don't think it's going to have a beneficial effect, regardless if it happens. No, but I don't think that was, that was Dawson's point, was it? Trying to make him a scapegoat. That when have we ever seen any evidence that Southgate's that kind of man? He's always about protecting players. He's always oh, yeah, about 100%. trying to create. He's always about trying to create that good atmosphere in that England squad. There's no yeah. way on earth, you know, you can slate him as much as you want that. It would not be his reason for taking him off, so he's got a scapegoat. He's got an excuse. No, 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 no. That's no, no. That's not my point. That, no, that I know it's not, and that's what I'm, I'm saying to Kemp. I think Kemp kind of got it twisted, saying that's that's what you you thought the point was. But no, no that's not. To be fair, I think that's more my point. Perhaps that, that there's that one school of thought in that you know, is he bringing him off? Is he using him as an example? You know, you had a really good game against Iran and then you had a game against USA and you weren't very good. So no matter who you are, I'm going to drag you. You know, I think it is, I agree with Sam, it is more about protecting him. That, that's why I and came you've just been he slate, And you've just been slating Southgate for dropping Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but this is my point. I understand why he did it, but there's a lot. I'm talking more about people outside of the team. I'm talking about fans. And oh, so it's not Southgate's myself. fault. I'm not saying it isn't his fault. Right. But Do my not... point about bringing Henderson on for leadership and all this kind of stuff that is more pointed at the fans that I've seen on social media and all this kind of stuff over the last few days like I said Jude Bellingham has been captain in one of the biggest sides in European football in Europe's biggest competition this season he's surrounded by players that are very experienced and are supposed to have leadership qualities at country's level but also their club level so I don't understand this whole oh, it's alright to play Henderson because he's a bit of a leader like to be fair, I'm not thinking. I'm not looking at anyway. that. I, to be fair, and, and going back on that, I'm not. I've not looked at social media or seen any of that shit. That's just, in my opinion, that's me going in Southgate's head and saying, right, why would why would Southgate drop Bellingham for Henderson? That's that's what I think. Yeah, I've not seen any right of that, that shit on that social guy. media. And, and if that is I'm the case, I don't agree with that reason. I'm but just, again, Southgate's I'm just saying, more qualified than me. Is he? Apparently so. Well, he thinks that Phil Foden's the fifth best winger in our team, so you can fucking put that one together yourself. At twelve. All right, give me the job then. I'd fucking rather it, man. <laughs> Do you not think that's what I was going to say? Do you not think the issue isn't so much with the fact that it was Bellingham that was taken off, but with Henderson that was coming on? Because I've seen people refer to Southgate and his style of football in such a negative manner that whilst we're not really creating too much against the USA, why not bring on another attacking player? Because Declan Rice is just going to sit there and defend anyway and try and hold things in front of the back four. Because he dan. That's what I'm saying. Do you think the issue's more with the fact that it was Henderson that came on than the issue being with Bellingham coming off? Well, who else would you put on? If 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 Southgate's logic was to bring Henderson on to shore the ship up a bit, you know, and, and steady that midfield, who else would you put on instead to do that role? Would I or would he? Any, any of you. What you're, who Me? would you do? Go on, oh, then. to shore up that role, I'd have if, left if, Rice there, and I'd have, if I'd have bring, been bringing Bellingham off at all, I'd have put on maybe Foden and used him in the middle, using a more attacking-style midfielder. Well, you drop Mount into centre-mid and pop Foden in, at number 10. In the more, make, yeah, I, in think, more attacking I think role. Mount is debatably the only one worse than Bellingham on that pitch. Mount, Bellingham and Saka were absolutely shocking. Any, any one of them three would have come off. He wouldn't have had much... Uh, I agree with that, and that. to be fair, I, I do agree. And my, my gripe, isn't taking Bellingham off and putting Henderson on in that game. That's not my gripe. Because like you say, Sam, Bellingham was having a poor performance and he dragged him and that's you, you get substituted, it is what it, it happens, is. Yeah. My point is more for the next game. That's my point. Mm, in the, okay. If we, you know, the only way we can not get out of the group is losing 4-0 against Wales, right? After Scared that performance death, against Iran, after that performance against Iran, if we lose 4-0 against Wales, they all ought to get sacked because they were terrible. 
right? Yeah. So if you're going to drop Bellingham and put Henderson in that in that role for that reason, for all those leadership qualities and all that shy, and any, and again, this is not me seeing on social media. This is just me in my head thinking about what Southgate would do. That means that he doesn't trust Bellingham to no. not fucking let you know be be a massive part of us losing four 0 against Wales. Yeah. But let him make mistakes. Booster, is that for Jude? Again, it wasn't it wasn't a must win game. It, you know, we're still I say we're still like it's definitely gonna happen, we never know, but we're very, very likely to still leave tomorrow evening, top it through, and it doesn't matter. The result doesn't matter. The result doesn't matter. It's the performance that is the issue. I said it earlier. It's uninspiring. Those kind of substitutions, like we said, we've got players like Phil Foden on the bench who Pep Guardiola regards as one of the best young talents. In, in world football, who teams like Spain, teams like Brazil, all these exciting attacking teams would have in their starting eleven, and we've got to build around them because we've got nothing to. We've got nothing. Well, that's for my. Him. That's been my point against about Southgate the entire time. It's the one thing you can say. In in let's talk about his achievements and all that at a different level, right? He's not one old, but fair enough. You, you talk about semi-final, you talk about final. The one thing, the staple of Gareth Southgate's England team is exactly that. It's uninspiring. And it's like I've said, he's, he's, he's shit scared to do anything that's going to risk losing a game that's going to... You know, he's, he's tournament-based. He's a tournament manager. He has gone far in tournaments before, albeit against weaker opposition, right? But he can't help that, right? And he, that's what he saw. He saw, right, let's get out of this. We're nil-nil. And then let's get to the next game and let's crack on. That's Gareth Southgate all over. And to be fair, like you say, it's not the result. The result is if we'd have battered him for 90 minutes, we'd have had 10 shots on target and we'd have played absolutely brilliant football, we'd all come out of that thinking, actually, you know what? We were unlucky there. Let's go again. Let's get out of this group. We're still positive. The fact was, it was shite for 90 minutes. And like I said, he's got no tactical capability to change it. When it's not going his way from the first whistle, the man hasn't got a fucking clue. Wow. I can't wait for tomorrow night. I'm going to say, buzzing now for big build up. So I think we best change subject, Dag, because. Uh, <laughs> just... What the fuck did you expect game me on this day? <laughs> I don't know. There we go then. So uh, we'll look towards the game against Wales. Um, Wales, I think, up until the sending off of Hennessy, was set to get a point against Iran. He was kind of very much keeping them yeah, in the it was game. No, no, so... Mate. so yeah, they were set to get a point, you're right. No, by which I mean, despite Iran's dominance in the game. Hennessy was very much keeping them in in the game. So as soon as he got sent off, all right, okay, fair enough. As soon as he got sent off, it changed it anyway. Um, And Iran walked out 2 0 winners. So up against Wales, with albeit the backup goalkeeper, who is, I believe, Danny Ward, still goalkeeper for Leicester Leicester, at the moment. So how how do you think. He's dreadful. Have you seen him much at club level? It's it's been all right. He started the season awfully, but the last sort of month to six weeks before the before the break for the World Cup he improved massively and that was shown in Leicester's um, much better form as well but yeah the first if I were a Wales fan I'd be shitting myself about him uh, he's, he's been he's been much better these last few weeks but yeah he, he didn't have the best first couple of months how do you expect Wales to approach the game with us then like you've just said they've got to beat us 4-0 they're going to attack straight from the off do you with the, with England's side then do you just go with the exact same 11 that played against the USA I know it's easy to say that uh, Mount shouldn't be starting or Henderson will be starting over Bellingham we don't know until the team news comes out tomorrow so what's your thoughts with how we're going to try and counteract what we expect from Wales we know they're going to have to go all out attack they're going to have to go for broke aren't they really because they've got nothing to lose yeah, yeah they've got, it, they've got, go on Sam no you're alright go on I was going to say they need to win 4-0 as, as you said there Adam but part of me thinks they know deep down they're not going to win 4-0 unless there's some kind of absolute miracle so what's plan B we need to win 4-0 to get through. We can't do that. So what can we do? We can cause as many problems for England as possible to try and hold them to a point or you know, even scrape a winner, which then potentially affects them topping the group, depending on the USA Iran result. So personally, I think they might lean more towards plan B as opposed to going all out attack to get that 4-0 win. If they needed to win 1-0, 2-0, then yeah, absolutely. But it's a little bit different when they need to win 4-0. So I think they might play more to frustrate England and potentially harm their chances at top in the group. That's what I think anyway. In terms of the team, I would revert back to um, 3-4-3 but I would play Trent in that sort of right midfield role because of the attacking tendencies he's got, the passing ability he's got and then you play Kyle Walker on the right side of that back three to cover um, Trent defensively 
So that's where that's where I would go. So three four three, I'd go Pickford, Walker, Stones, Maguire. I'd go Trent, Jude, Rice, Shaw as the four man midfield, and then I'd go Stacker, uh, Stacker, Saka, <laughs> Kane, and then either Grealish or Rashford. I think they're they're a bit more attacking. I think Sterling, his club form hasn't been great. Other than his goal against Iran, he's he's been quiet. He's he's not been quite that that sort of urgent approach that he's had in the past that he had in the Euros last year. So that's how I take it. But yeah, I, I fully expect it to be a, a much more conservative approach once the lineups are announced tomorrow night. Fair enough. Kemp, dare I ask? It's gonna be boring, I can tell you that. Okay, uh, we'll move I'm on mad. to Sam then. And I'm and I'm hoping I am hoping for God I'm hoping that I'm wrong again because I've been wrong a lot recently with these predictions. But it's it's boring. Uh, it's it's conservative from both. I agree with Dawson. Wales know that they're not going to win four uh, nil. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure they they know they're not going to four nil realistically. So I think it's going to be a boring game, and I, I honestly don't see us coming out of it with much positivity. And to tell you the truth, and again, this is me being really negative, but I don't care. I honestly can see Wales doing this because they're up for it. They are proper up for it. They're going to be really up for it against us. They've had a shocking campaign so far. If they can get a win against us, you know what? That that's just it's, it's bragging rights more than anything else. So, I'm not confident. I think Wales might come away with a a one nil win. Um, and and there's going to be serious questions asked. And it's not going to send us into last sixteen with the uh, with with all the positivity in the world, Sam. To be honest. Yeah, um, I think. There will be a couple of changes, won't they? I think, well, we've already pretty much been confirmed that Henderson is coming in midfield for, for Bellingham. So, straight away, that's telling you it is going to be a bit more of a conservative approach. I probably do agree with Dawson in the three at back, four in mid, midfield, and uh, three up top, just to, just to give us a couple of more bodies going forward. I agree with but, that as well. I agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, what, what do we think? Well, I suppose moving to that 3 4 3 and playing Henderson, you, you remove. Mount from that situation, yeah. don't you? It's kind of a walker coming in for Mount, but yeah, still no place for Foden. You, you know, does he play him as one of the wingers potentially? But as Kemp said, if if Southgate is classing him as a winger and doesn't see him in that central position, there's currently four other players that he ranks above him. So it'd be interesting to see what that front three looks like, and also what it looks like if you know we an hour into the game we're struggling to get a goal or whatever the score might be. It's not as was just not as convincing as we'd hope. It'd be interesting to see how he might change, but he, he has struggled to sort of be a bit more on the ball with making those uh, making those changes to to suit what what's needed. A bit stubborn in terms of sticking to the setup and the lineup. But yeah, yeah my it's... front three, I think I would probably go Grealish, Kane, and Saka. I think that'd be my front three. That's from left to right, actually. That is. So yeah, probably wouldn't start phoning again. So I'm probably going to get some stick for that, but I just think it has to come off the bench. If it it, it has to feature in some way, um, and yeah, I probably won't start him, but yeah, I'd be bringing him on. I'd be more tempted to go with Rashford over Grealish. I think his confidence is going to be sky from what he did against Iran. Give him a chance from the beginning to see what he can do and what he can input. I'd have Foden in over Mount. And there's the expected change that's going to happen that I wouldn't do personally, which is going to be Henderson in for uh, for Jude. That game was screaming out for Rashford to come on so much earlier. And and even you look at when Grealish came on as well, like he got the ball. And again, the commentators noticed this. He got the ball, he ran towards the edge of the box, he got into the box. There was four USA players around him. Like, yeah. That's just with one run. And that's the kind of urgency that we, we were lacking so much. And, and this goes back to, and I do agree with Kemp on this in terms of the tactical side of it because it was prevalent in the Euros, even in decent games and in the World Cup as well. There just seems to be that, it just seems to be slacking in terms of being quicker to pull the trigger on making those changes. Scared. Yeah, Grealish and Rashford should have been on 10, maybe even 15 minutes earlier. In Here's that a game question for you. How bad does Harry Kane have to play in order I was to literally get substituted? Just about to, I was literally just about to come in at the end of what Dawson said then. And I think Dawson mentioned in his team, Dawson, who did you mention you have as the front three in your team? Uh, I said Saka, Kane, and then either Rashford or Grealish. So right, so I would take Kane out and put Rashford in. Yeah, really. I wouldn't be against I, I, that. I would, I, I would take, I would take Kane out and put Rashford in, especially if Wales come for us, because the amount of times that Rashford, you know, in recent times he's not put all his chances away, but how many times has he beat that offside trap for Man United and got through on goal? Yeah, and if he has got, fantastic and if you have got season. Danny Donkey in net, 
you know, one on one against him, I'm backing Rashford all day, week, every day, week. So for me, I would agree with keeping Saka on right. I'd put Foden on left, um, and I'd put Rashford through middle because you know it's let's let's just try something different. You know, we lose four nil. We're not going to lose four nil against Wales. Try something different. Put Rashford down middle. You don't have to keep him there. Put him down middle. See what he's got. You know, if if you're going to drop Kane for a game. This is the game that you do it. And Kane, to be fair, in these first two games, has been an absolute non-entity. That's what I was really getting at when I said how bad does he have to play to a substitute? I was talking about in-game, really, because I think Southgate should have had every right to take him off on, on you know, on the basis of last game. And he, just, and he stayed on for the full night. He kept dropping way too deep, as he always does. And then you've got like you've got players like Rashford. I know he come on, but get him up, get him up top. Get Callum Wilson, see what he can do. It's, do you uh, have Callum it's Wilson up one. top over Rashford? As a centre forward, I possibly would. Would you? Uh, yeah, I think Rashford on left all day. Um, I prefer but, Rashford up top. Uh, Rashford, I, really yeah, I do, do as well. Rashford and he's really th- not wing. You look at his increase in form this season. He spent the last two, three, four seasons out on the left for Man United with all the different central figures they've had: Ronaldo, Cavani. You know, that's not effective. Out on the is left. He's not effective he's, out there. He's not. He's not not effective. To be fair to him, he's he's struggled, but I think that's. You know, he's had a lot of niggling injuries that he's not treated and that kind of stuff, which has definitely played a part. But him in that central role, playing off of the shoulder of that last man, is there's no coincidence that he's seen the increase in form that he's had for Manchester United. He's more United, effective down middle, isn't he? That's that's yeah. what I'm getting at. I'm, yeah. I don't think he has been effective out wide. I'm going to disagree with you there. But, you know, there have been bigger problems, like you say, niggling injuries at Man United. But he's he's so much more effective down middle. And that's what I'd do. I'd take Kane off. I'd give him a rest. He had that little knock in last game. So you give him a little bit of a rest. Let him rest up for the last 16. Because, you know, we're, we're basically, we're going to be in it. Let's be, let's, you know, let's be honest. I'm being positive about I'm that. not saying it, just for the record. I'm not saying well, it. Well, no, you, you <laughs> don't say a fucking word. You keep your mouth short. But, yeah, let's get Rashford in there. Let's get Foden in there. Let's get sacked. Let's just play with a bit of freedom. Which we won't do because it's South. I think that that's a very good word that you've used there, freedom. But it won't, we, uh, we don't uh, play with it because we're scared. We don't. We don't. And, and that, terrified. What a beat, freedom ninety. That I think was like a, a light bulb in my head. Then when you said that, I know I've I've stuck on uninspiring, but I think the key to that is freedom because the squad that we've got is unbelievable. I would put our whole squad right up there against any other country in the world why we've you know we talk about the golden generation from 06 and they were players in their prime in that moment your Terry's your Gerrard's your Lampard's your Scholes your Rooney's you know we know how good that team was but that wasn't about the future that was about the now that was about the the all these players in their prime at the same time with this squad we're set for this tournament for the next Euros, for the next World Cup in USA in, in 2020. Maybe even the next Euros oh, sorry, after 2026. that. Maybe even maybe. the next Euros after that. Maybe even the next Euros after that. But if we don't capitalise on this now while they're young, while their development is so key, while their confidence is so key, we're going to have a team of players that are still young in two years' time, in four years' time, but are going to be very experienced. And the last thing that you want to do is give them that mental block of them struggling to get Strangling over the line. them. He's strangling them. That's what he's doing. And, and if you ask anybody, anybody with a brain cell who's watched one game of football can tell you that this England team, especially the first 11, is, is top heavy. We've got real quality up top. I think personally, the only, pl- the only two players that have got potential to be the best players in the world at their position and therefore world class, in my opinion, are Phil Foden and Jude Bellingham. They are two of the best rising stars in the entire world and Gareth Southgate in the in the type of football that he plays this negative conservative football because he's so, so scared at getting at getting torn apart by you know second rate teams that he's strangling them and he's stopping that development and that confidence to say you know all our best players are our forward players so let's go forward and let's use what you know the, the, the tools that we've got it's almost as if he's saying you know I've got this machine gun in one hand that's me attack and I've got this bloody BB gun in my left hand that's my defence and I'm going to fucking use my BB gun it just it, it boggles the mind boggles on that man honest to God just to close off my point was that this is we're not going Sorry. into this tournament you're right, mate you're alright we're not going into this tournament as we can fucking do this and, and we are in a sense but it's a we can do this but four years ago we got to the semi-finals the Euros we almost did it we, we're already right on the fucking line now of having that mental Pacific. block of being the prefaces. Oh. oh, I fucking nearly got it. We, we're right on that now of not this is our moment, but the, oh, are we bottle jobs? 
And that is not what we need with the core of this squad going into the next few years of, of the big tournaments. Our time is now, and we've got to capitalise on it. We can't keep almost getting there. We, we, we've got to do this for their confidence and their development, because if we can, this squad will dominate for the next few tournaments and not just uh, we're not quite sure, because we're not. We're going into this tournament and we're not quite sure, and we shouldn't be thinking that with the squad that we've got on paper. Just a quick anyway, update as well, sorry. just unless unless Sam or Adam wants to add anything to this. I've just seen that it's heavily rumoured that Kyle Walker will be starting tomorrow. So make Ooh, it yeah, what slightly. you will. That's it then. Be three, 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 three. Three. I'm happy with that. Whether he starts at right back or centre back, I'm happy with Kyle Walker's inclusion to be fair. Because I don't think Trippier really did much against USA no, I anyway. I that. think he I gave agree. the ball away a bit too easily. Yeah, Walker won't be right back. He'll be he'll be the right sided player of that back three. But I, I would like to see Trent. I, I've given Trent as much stick as anyone for his defensive capabilities this season. But like Kemp said, why not? Play with a bit of freedom. He's a fantastic player that a lot of the top countries around the world would have him in their starting eleven. So let's go for it. Let's try it. Trippier has been brilliant. I've been one of his biggest sort of supporters in terms of his England performances over the last few years. But let's just go for it. Give someone like Trent a chance and, and see what we can and do. And Trent in that back five as well. And Trent in that back five as well, like you say, he's got Cal Walker covering behind him. You know, that's Trent's biggest problem is his defensive capabilities. If you've got somebody behind him sweeping up, then I rate Trent in about five. I just don't rate him doing any defensive work, so we'll see. And it effectively would just be Walker keeping an eye on Gareth Bale, isn't it? Let's be fair, yeah. that's what they're going to go with. Uh, let's go on to predictions then for England against Wales. I've gone for a late England winner. England won Wales nil. Sam, we'll come to you first. Uh, I will go for a 1-0 England victory. Another one nil. Okay, skin. Honestly, I really, really, really don't know. I'd love to go for a, an efficient two nil win to get the job done. Deep down, I do think we'll win because we have to win and we should win. I really want it to be exciting again. One one. And Kemp. Just on something that Dawson said. Then we don't have to win. We don't have to win. And in Southgate said we don't have to win. So for me, I, I'm I'm edging. I'm I'm sort of teetering on between nil nil and one nil Wales. I'm I'm gonna go nil nil. I'm gonna go nil nil, but it really would not surprise me if Wales won one nil. Well looking at the clues, if he is going to a back three slash five and Henderson is coming in, he's playing not to lose in T. That's yeah, he exactly is. he's playing not to lose. And that's so. why I'm going nil nil. Until yeah, yeah. until we sort of got that confirmation on Henderson and, and potentially Walker as well. Because if he's bringing Walker in, I think he's bringing him at centre half. So yeah, I'm I'm going nil nil. Yeah, and that seems to be the overall top line approach, doesn't it? I saw a quote the other day after the USA game, and unfortunately I can't remember it, but it was obviously around the the lack of urgency and all that kind of stuff that we had already spoken about. But basically, it came down to we seem to set up and play to not lose as a as opposed to set up and play to win. So yeah. I think you've nailed it there, Sam. But what a point. sorry state of affairs that is that we're going into no, a game awful. against Wales not to fucking lose. Yeah. It's awful. And again, and, I, and I've been a Southgate critic and I get it and I'm sorry, but this is my biggest fucking problem with him. We're going into a game against Wales who've been spanked by a poor Iran not to lose and I can't uh, stand it. Especially on a game that's essentially a free shot. It's like it's not yeah. like we've got a point and we need to go in and get a result. Yeah. We, yeah. we could, like you say earlier, we could still start Bellingham and, you know, if we did lose 1-0, we the odds are we're still going through anyway so yeah it is it is a bit of a head scratch that is going so pan it's like his knee jerk reaction into it he's, he had a bit of a stuttery performance against uh, US so all of a sudden he's got to make changes and, and it, you know just go out and play Wales and play to attack like we did mm -hmm. first game see what happens I can't stand it yeah. if we do draw or if we do the unthinkable does happen and we do lose to Wales then there's a chance that if Iran beat the USA they go through as group winners and we go through as runners up which means we play on Saturday instead of Sunday and it's a completely different way through to the final the only way I've looked at is if we were to win that group so we'll look at over the weekend's fixtures the player of the round we'll start with you Skin I'm going to stick with the game that we've been on and I'm going to say Harry Maguire he came out of that game nice. with such a spotlight on him, such praise. He, he was the defensive rock that he's been known for being. He was fantastic in the air. Every corner, every cross, everything in the air that came into that box, he was the one there that was clearing it. It was like they were aiming for him. He had a magnet in his head that that ball was coming towards every single time. On the ground, in and around outside of the box, when USA were tackling around that sort of central right position that he was guarding, he was putting a foot and he was tackling. He, he had... 
almost the perfect performance on Friday. And it's well documented about his struggles at club le- club level, and and well documented about how he was in the in last year's Euros and things like that. But he was absolutely phenomenal. And if the rest of the squad came out of that game with uh, with their head held high as much as he did it would have been a, a more than convincing result, but unfortunately not. So yeah, Harry Maguire for me has to be the player of the weekend. And for him to come out of his, you know, out of that result with his head held high, I mean, that's some fucking going because that's that must be some heavy head that. Imagine <laughs> lifting that one up high. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ, yeah. you get neck ache thinking about it. Yeah. Fair enough. Very good shout. Kemp? I'm going to go with another player for another team that had a draw. And <laughs> I'm going to go with Jamal Musiala. I think everything that Germany did that was positive, he was the the, the 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 he started it all off. I think he's a fantastic player. I, I said it in again, peek behind the curtain in the group chats. If I was a Premier League top four, top six club, I'd be doing absolutely everything in my power. I know he's at Bayern, but the Premier League is where you want to be. And you know, if I were Pep at Man City, I'd be giving you know, I'd I'd, I'd be marching into my my board of directors saying, listen, we need this kid. Because he's 19 years of age, I think he's a real talent. And like I say, everything that Germany did that was good against Spain, I think it came from him. So I'm going to say Musiala. Sam? Uh, Plated with a couple, as I usually do. Um, I was going to go Mbappe with his two goals. I thought he was absolutely excellent. Uh, And then it was basically, essentially today, two players stood out for me today. But I'm going to commit to one. And it's uh, it's Kudus of Ghana. His uh, his two goals helped them beat uh, South Korea. He looks like a very exciting young talent. So I'm uh, I'm going to give him the shout out. My my other one that was teetering on was Abu Bakar. He come off the bench at half time and uh, he famously said that he uh, if he thought he was as good as uh, Salah if he was given the yeah. chance. Um, he come off, scored a scored a wonderful chip, and then he assisted yeah. the uh, the second one as well. That, so that chip was gorgeous, unbelievable. Right? He, was. You could t- he knew he were offside. He thought he were offside, didn't he? Yeah, he, 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 he was just he would not about. try that. Yeah, he would not try that if he thought he were onside. And it was that much of a calm finish. It was absolutely. And it was the nonchalant celebration for me as well because yeah. he thought he were offside. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. But yeah, he yeah, realized like soccer aid, weren't it? He was just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 then he realized he and he went mental. Yeah, it would class that. But no, I'm going to give it a kudos. Um, I thought he were. I thought he were excellent so yeah that's my uh, player I was going to you know what I was teetering between him and Musiala believe it or not yeah I'm not surprised another very good shout come on then Aggie it's got to be a town player for Um, you no, I, ain't, I haven't gone for a town player. I've stuck within the theme of the Mongo World Cup. And, and Sam's already mentioned him. I've gone with Mbappe. Two goals against Denmark as a side. France just look very dominant. And you give Mbappe even half a chance and he's more than often than not, he's going to convert it for you. So I've given it to Mbappe with his two goals against Denmark to see France through into the quarterfinals. But you saying that I was going to go with the Chesterfield player brings us on nicely to the FA Cup third round draw, which was done just before we started recording. Uh, Chesterfield in the third round for the second consecutive year. We are at home to 21st in the championship, West Brom. And I think you said at the beginning, Skin, before we started recording, that it's when you're in the National League was and you get taking to the, the third round of the F- how you say cunt? Um, Kent. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Along those but, lines. It was I don't know what that's time. got to do with this, but yeah, carry on. It's completely irrelevant, but you bring it up as you want. Um, no, against West Brom, like you said, it, it's one of those games where when you're in the third round and you're a National League side, you either want a game that you can win and you can get through to the next round on, or you want a side like your Chelsea's or your Manchester United's away from home to go and enjoy your big day out. And I've seen some people already on Chesterfield supporter pages feeling that West Brom at home is a winnable game. Now, I'm not sure from neutral perspectives what you guys think of that, but I'm very much against it and just They're thinking... They're all Gary Marsden's burner accounts, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that last year told me that he thought we had a very realistic chance of beating Chelsea in the third round. Okay, now, crap, but... I think it's just going to be one of them games, isn't it, that you just go and enjoy the experience of facing a championship side. And if if we do get something out of it, we do, but just going with absolutely zero expectation, I know I am. If we win, we win, but just enjoy playing West Brom. I think Brom. the main benefits of that for your... But from a Chesterfield point of view, is the financial side of things. 100%. West Brom at home, it's, it's going to bring in quite a lot of revenue. You know, will you be able to, I know you're a fan-led club or you're run by a trust. So I think that's going to be a real, you know, boost for you this season. If you get a result, obviously that's going to be, you know, go down in, in club history as one of the best results, you know, in a long, long time. I don't think you're going to get a result. But as we said, you know, before the podcast started, I'm going to try and get tickets for that because I think it will be a great occasion if nothing else. Don't Absolutely. let Gary Marsden hear you say that, mate, be fuming. 
How's that? Glory support there. Just, just eight people trying to get tickets for big games, but then they're not there on a Tuesday night away at Dover. Oh, for fuck's sake. There's only about seven of them there on a Tuesday night at Dover. Jesus Christ. Well, Imagine if everybody did that. Let, let's not take the piss too much. Aggie, but, yeah. come on then, mate. Right. You're, I, know, I know you're trying to play house. I know you're trying to play central, you know, unbiased figure, but... Chesterfield are in the third round draw, mate. Big 2-0 win away. The second or the back-to-back win against a League 2 side. They're now rewarded with a game against the Championship side. They they seem to be getting back into a bit of form in the National League as well. Come on, mate. How are you feeling? What, you've got to be positive. Are you thinking, is this the year? Are you thinking, we're very, very good, but Notts County and Wrexham are just a little bit better. If we're going to do it, we're going to go through the playoffs. Talk to us, Ag. Give us that bit of passion. Where are your thoughts at with Chesterfield Football Club right now? I don't think Wrexham are better at all. When we played them at the Technique Stadium, I know we were a better football inside you than them. You mate. I were there. Yeah, goes without saying. And then against Notts you County... You fucking Dover though, did you, you prick? I did not, but I will go to West Brom. Not that's you, all that skin. <laughs> oh, right, no. He didn't even. Did he? Very nice. Yeah, he always invites me. <laughs> he only ever talks to me about it. It's like talking away. He's like, are you going? Don't fucking oh, invite no. me and I'm actually a supporter. Are you going? As if he's, <laughs> as if he's, he's a season ticket holder. Are you going, are you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. sorry. Carry no, I, I, I think we've got a very realistic chance of winning the league. We've got a lot of talent in depth. I think as soon as the transfer window is over in January, we'll know more because it depends on whether Langstaff stays with Notts County because he's the only person that's really consistently performing for them. And if he leaves, they've not really got too much else to compete with. Um, we'll get past them and then it'll just be a case of, of beating Hollywood, wouldn't it really? And then we go from there and we've already beaten them and we know that we're better than them. So see what happens. As for third round draw, it's like what Kemp said, it's just extra money in, in the pocket, isn't it? To help the club push forward and hopefully a bit more of a spending spree when we get back into the Football League next season. Imagine though, Ag, imagine if you beat West Brom and then you get like Man United at home. Imagine that. Well, I'd rather him away. Imagine I'm not going to be ungrateful though. If you're going to give me Man United imagine at home, I'll take Imagine the money. It. Away at home, don't matter. Man United, Man City, Chelsea, one of those... Oh, Off a gate, don't you? In a, in a cup tie. Away imagine. against Chelsea traffic. last year were absolutely phenomenal. I didn't get back till half past one, but the experience of going to, to watch Chelsea away was just incredible. So, yeah, yeah I'd love to get another one of them cool. sort of sides in the, in the fourth round. So, uh, moving on to Derby against Barnsley, two sides in League Good One. Derby. This is all uh, all over to you then, Sam. I've not got a lot to say about this, mate. To be honest, it's pretty inspiring, isn't it, Barnsley? It's, uh, yeah, not Stone Throw Down Road. Well, it's at, I think it's at Derby, isn't it? But, yes. no, I ain't got a lot to uh, lot to add to this one. We, sh- we should w- win that, I think. And uh, and if we don't, so be it. We'll concentrate on league. That's you reckon they're above you in the league? Yeah, but Derby, isn't it? Being, Derby's, Derby's priorities this season are getting out of League One. Yeah. And, you know, or, or if not getting out of League One, getting themselves ready next season to get out of League One. And to be fair, I don't yeah, know if you're going to ask me. Cup run, bit of, bit of money in bank. No, nah, I don't think, you know, for Derby, for Chesterfield, it's different. For Derby, I think you play your kids against that one and you focus on League. And to be fair, I, I don't know if you were going to ask me about Sheffield United Millwall, but it's exactly the same. I, I, I couldn't care less. I'm not bothered about a cup run. We're, we're doing all right in League. Let's play kids, get down there, take a 1 0 loss and move on. To be fair, mate, I was just about to ask you about the game against Millwall. Copy so, and uh, paste, copy and paste what go. Sam said, and take away Stone Throw Down Road. Skin, do we say the same for Man United Everton? Yeah, it's just it's one of them ties where you think, fuck's sake, you, you know, it's a game they should win, but you you want to give one of the the lower league sides a chance. You mentioned it yourself about Chesterfield coming out, and then the next tie was Man City against Chelsea. It's the main event of the weekend. It'll no doubt get that Saturday evening or potentially Saturday sort of um, early afternoon TV coverage, but you want it a bit more spread out. There, I think West Ham got Brentford or something like that. There's a lot of, it's quite a few old Premier League ties. You don't really want that at, at this time of the uh, at this time of the cup. You want you want your League Twos, your non-League teams getting the opportunity. So yeah, Man United versus Everton is just meh. Like, your perspective though, Dawson, from your perspective, and I suppose other Premier League football clubs fans' perspective, perspectives, especially clubs in the sort of top six, top ten. Eric Ten Hag coming in, if he finishes top four, brilliant season. But if Eric Ten Hag finishes top four and you go an FA Cup under your belt, surely do you not want somewhere in pity your stomach to think, go on, go for it? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Oh, yeah, 100%. If that would be such a positive first season, just top four would be a positive start. Yeah, the silverware, though, do you know season, what I mean? The silverware. The, the silver, yeah, the, the FA Cup would be brilliant. I just. I just mean as a as a whole, you know, we talk about that magic of the F- FA Cup. You know, Man United Everton as a quarter final game is as a semi final game is is yeah, let's 
let's go for a cup run. My my thoughts are just purely on that black and white, seeing the draw. You know, you get excited. The FA FA Cup third round is one of the biggest sort of days in the domestic league calendar. It, you want to see those ties where you wouldn't Giant normally see. Yeah, no, I agree with that. See. I understand exactly where you're coming. I completely that, that agree. That was more I my think. point. Not, not no, no, I, I understand United. your point I and I completely agree, but that's sort of my follow-up question there for on Manchester United. Surely you look at this now and think, let's boot Everton out. City and Chelsea yeah. have got each other. One of them's going. So, yeah. you know, it's a real good opportunity potentially for you to get some silverware and that would be a yeah, great then. start for Ten Hag. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I completely agree with that side of it. In just a few moments' time then, we'll be back talking about the NFL and reviewing Week 12 action. Welcome back to Episode 8 of Loaded Sport, where we're now going to have a look at Week 12 of the... Week 12 of the NFL. Um, Sam, we're going to start by talking to you with the late game that took place on Sunday night between the Eagles and Green Bay last week. I spoke to you about the potential of dropping Aaron Rodgers. It happened, maybe not through the greatest of circumstances with him going off injured, but you finally got a chance to see Jordan Love. Mm, We bloody did, Mm. didn't we? And you know what? Little bit of love. Mm, Little bit of the bubbly. You know what? (laughs) It weren't that bad. Actually, Ooh. weren't that bad. I would be very tempted. Our season's done, essentially, right? Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. Um, we're not going to make playoffs. We don't particularly want to make playoffs now. So that's it. Rogers, as I said last week, get him on IR. Let's roll with love for the last couple of games. See what we've got. If through an absolute peach in the middle of the field to uh, Christian Watson, my uh, my guy, the rookie, and he just went, took it to the house. Let's uh, Let's keep that sort of chemistry going because they're going to need each other if they are going to flourish as Green Bay Packers. See a bit of potential in there? What did I just say? <laughs> he literally <laughs> didn't listen. said that. Didn't fucking Honestly, listen. It was, it was, it was potential, absolutely yeah? amazing. He, he threw some absolutely brilliant balls. He looked composed. He looked really good. Nah, shit, Sam, mate. what did you think of Jordan Love? <laughs> shit, no, mate. I just Absolute asked if you shit. saw potential. That's a completely different question. Asking if you've seen potential. Of course, different. of course there's potential, mate. He's a, young, he's a young guy. He's had a couple of years behind Rodgers. He's got bad to have learned a couple of things from him. We've, uh, we've never really seen him, you know, in game. I mean, I know we've seen him in that Chiefs game, but that was shocking. Yeah, but, it was different. Yeah, it was away as well. I mean, I know Eagles were away, I suppose. But no, no, he's come in and he's, uh, he's done, a, done a good job last night, to be fair. I watched the first half. Absolutely class first half, I must admit. We, we did go in at the break slightly behind, but I caught uh, I caught Mudge, his comment, obviously a famous Eagles fan. He, um, he commented, it was like the first 10 minutes of the game, we were, we were down 13-0 straight away. Rodgers had threw an inception, and straight away he put in chat, um, I think these Green Bay Packers are done, aren't they? And then about five minutes later, it was 14-13 to us, and I was so smug and I was so dying to write something back in chat, but I thought, no, I know what I'm like, I'll jinx it. So I just sat quietly, just mentioned that I had been watching it. And uh, yeah, ooh, good game. Enjoyed it, actually. Well, first off, as I say, and then I caught upon on highlights what I'd missed. But yeah, let's go with love. Let's see what we've got. There were some high-scoring games over the course of the weekend. Eagles, like we've just mentioned, beat Packers 40-33. to Raiders beat Seahawks 40-34. to Chargers Cardinals 25-24 to the Chargers. That finished. There were a couple of overtime games as well. Um, a late two-point conversion for the Jaguars over the Ravens um, gave them the win. I'm just looking for the one that went to overtime as well. I'm pretty sure there was one. Where was it? Bucks Browns. Bucks Browns, that's the one. I'm fucking useless at this. Uh, Bucks Browns went to overtime. Browns winning 23 17, which I was going to say, Sam, I think you claimed that as your wild card as well, didn't you? Yep. Yeah, and I've got to uh, thank my boy Kemp on this one because he, <laughs> um, if I remember rightly, he took the Packers beating the Eagles, and it was I was literally about to say it as he said it. And he took that, so I went, well, fuck the lot of you then. I'm having... Oh, no, that was Eckler touchdown, wasn't it? Which, yeah. ironically, was coming as well. But no, that was my uh, upset of the week, the uh, the brands to beat the Bucks. And, uh, yeah, quite happy with that. Excellent. We'll come over to you first, then, Skin, for your player of week 12. Player of week 12, mate. There's there's plenty of players that I could give it to, uh, you know, that have, have had their had their flowers had their recognition over over the season and over the years. So I think on this occasion, I'm going to give it to a player that has not quite had that to the level that we might have expected. And I'm going to give it to Trevor Lawrence. Now, Trevor Lawrence guided the Jaguars to a very late win 
against Baltimore Ravens, 28-27. They went for the two-pointer with 14 seconds left uh, to, to win the game instead of trying to take it to overtime. But Trevor Lawrence finished 29 of 37, 321 yards for three touchdowns. In that fourth quarter, in those last couple of drives, he, he was absolutely fantastic. Uh, with six minutes to go, the Jaguars were down by nine points. And, yeah, I can't fault the lad. I think that probably is the best game of his still relatively short career so far. Not even uh, close. Yeah. 100%. Uh, and and it's what, potentially... You just mentioned that game there. That sounds like an exciting game, that. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, mate. We'll get into that in a minute. But, yeah, one of the... I can't remember who it was, but there was a post-match interview with one of the Jaguars players, and, and his name uh, has slipped my mind. But, basically, it was... He was talking about Trevor Lawrence's performance and, and he said, under Urban Meyer, Trevor Lawrence had to deal with that and did he really have a rookie year? So I think in the in the dress, uh, Jaguars dressing room and, and in the franchise, they're sort of viewing this as Lawrence's first proper season and opportunity. And, and if that is one game, it is just one game. But if that is a sign of the player he can become with the setup that he's got around him and the coaching staff and the backroom staff that he's got to support and develop him, then you know Jaguars are, are only going to improve over these next four, uh, sorry, next few se- seasons. So now sit at four and seven. They've put Ravens to seven and four. Now tied with the Bengals. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to give Trevor Lawrence's well earned spotlight in the uh, Player of the Week segment. Nice, good shout. That also that win also means that the Steelers are now the closest to the Texans to take number one pick in the NFL draft. Kemp, your Player of Week Twelve. I'm going to go with Jalen Hurts. I think it was a really, really mm. exciting game. Um, his completion percentage wasn't amazing. He 16 from 28 attempts, but 153 passing yards, two touchdowns. But the reason I'm giving it him is because of the 157 rushing yards as well. You know, the impact that he has on the game, both passing and, and rushing as well. It's a, it's a massive asset for that for that Eagles team. 10-1, and one, it, it's all, you know, it's all coming up roses for uh, for Mudge and the Philadelphia Eagles. And Jalen Hurts is a massive part of that. So, I'm going Jalen Hurts this week. I think he had a good game. To put it into perspective as well, he's 150-something yards, you say, he rushed in the total game. 157. 103 yards of that was in the first quarter. That's just ridiculous. Isn't first it? quarter, yeah. Quarter. Right. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it popped yeah. off two. It popped off two 50-yard runs, like essentially drive back-to-back drives, and he just yeah. absolutely buried us early on. And for me, that's that's one of the biggest plus points about Jalen Hurts. It's, it's, I think his pocket presence is fantastic, and also he knows when it's on. He knows when to, to you know, like you say, two. Do you say two fifty-yard rushes there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you've got to have some sort of you know football IQ for that. And he's got it. I think he's got it in the locker. And as as a fellow NFC East uh, team supporter, NFC Jaylen beast. Hurts, yeah, Jalen Hurts worries me a little bit because he's going to be a bit of a beast from uh, from for a long time. But yeah, player of the week for me. I was going to go Jefferson, but in the end, I went Jalen Hurts. Do you play Eagles last game of the season as well? I'm um, not sure. It's, it's towards the back end. I don't know if it's the last. Fair enough. I'm going to say potentially a. Uh playoff deciding game in it for you that if um, it is then we're not getting the playoff <laughs> Sam we'll come across to you for your player of the week yeah so just looking you are right Eagles play Giants on the week 18 so you are correct there uh, my player of the week is and I've got a feeling I'm taking this out right out of your mouth it's Josh Jacobs you are I thought is, is that right yeah yeah you are <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I so. knew it uh, yeah I'm, I had to take him mate because at the end of the day I'm still sore about that trade in fantasy. First uh, week one, I traded uh, Josh Jacobs and Devonta Smith for Jerry Judy, which is the worst trade, I think, in fantasy history. And uh, yeah, Josh Jacobs, 229 rush yards, two touchdowns, 74 receiving yards yesterday. And it absolutely crucified your Seattle Seahawks. So I am going to do you a favour and not let you say him because I, I just know that I'd stick in your teeth if you had to go against Seattle. So I'll, I'm doing you a favour there, mate. No, I appreciate that. It did give me mixed emotions knowing that I'd won the fantasy game against you, but at the same time we'd lost in overtime yeah. to the Raiders. 82 yards is final uh, rush for a touchdown as well that, that killed the game off. Yeah, I must admit, the same sort of logic. I was thinking about going Dak Prescott for mine. I think he had a really good game, really efficient. But yeah, for the same reason as you, Ag, there. Um, it would have pained me to do so. So I think Sam saved you on that one. 
Yeah, certainly has. It means I'm going to move on to the second choice that I actually wrote down this week as well. Um, I'm going to go with Miles Sanders. I mentioned um, as one of my predictions, my my lock scorer for uh, Miles Sanders to get a touchdown. Sam backed it up saying that the Green Bay's defense is dreadful against the run. I think that's already been proven from (laughs) Kemp's stats that is given for Jalen Hurts as well. Just to back it up, uh, Miles Sanders, 21 rushing attempts for 143 yards and two touchdowns and three receptions for a further 17 yards as the Eagles, like you say, go to 10-1. and one. So very much deserving of uh, my player of the round, I think, for uh, yeah, for week fair 12. Fair pick that, mate. Fair pick that. Mm. Um, Someone would say we know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, some NFL. of us do. Com, just reach mm. out to us. Loaded spot on Facebook. Not me. Spot not me. <laughs> yes, don't again. come at me. No. I was going to say, that brings us on to the, uh, the predictions that we made. Made, no, 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 no! I'm going to stop you right here because I, yes. I wanted an honourable be- mention, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to take your thunder away in case you use this person. I'm going to give an honourable mention to Mike White of the New York Jets. Yeah, 315 yards, three touchdowns without a pick. He would have been. He was my backup for the uh, if, if if anyone had gone to Josh Jacobs first. So just throw Mike White out there. Our youth, <laughs> your brother. I think yeah. I think Jets are they're going to be rolling with him, aren't they? He. I think um, so. It's little little stat for you. Um, in four starts for the New York Jets, Mike White has two games with three plus passing touchdowns. In mm. twenty games for the New York Jets, Zach Wilson has zero games with oh, wow. three plus passing touchdowns. So get him in. Not not to say that he's the future of that franchise, and you know we're we're verging on Jets class and Zach Wilson as a bust, and do they potentially look at trading him? But. It, it looks like Mike White could be the man under centre for, for the next few weeks for the New York Jets and when he has played for them he's performed so I wouldn't blame him and he would he would deserve it based on what he has produced for them so far so yeah some big developments potentially coming in, in New York but I'm sure we'll know more once we get to the preview show later in the week I have got a quick question for you guys there then because you guys have, have watched the NFL for longer than I have is this the latest in a season that a team with with a realistic chance that are very much set towards the playoffs, are pissing about with the quarterback situation. I really don't mind who answers that first. I have no idea who knows the answer to it. Um, I mean, I wish you'd have prepped us for that because that's, that's, that's yeah, a difficult yeah, that, question. It covers a lot of bases. Yeah, it's, that's, that's uh, one for a bit of research, one, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think so. Have Why a think, and I'll re-ask it on show. the preview show when there we uh, go, look towards so. the Jets. I'll, I'll write that question back in R in. It was just so something you be mentioned. someone somewhere, and there might even be an obvious team where we thought, "Oh yeah, of course." Like he came in quite, you know, a bit late into the season. Through no injury but... relation, just pure performance-based mm. change. Yeah, I think the interview did it for Zach Wilson. Wilson. You're going to be asking us what square root of pi is next. Jesus Christ! Give well, us a bit of time to prepare for these. Adams. That's just a question that came off the back of what you guys were talking about. Oh. Then, okay, fair enough. We'll move on to the predictions that we made on the preview show of last week. Then. Skin, we'll start by looking at yours because it's the order in which I've written it down. Three out of your six were actually successful, in which yeah, Uruguay, fiddy, fiddy. Patriots, and Lukaku didn't succeed for you. Uh, Kenny Walker scored, was it within like 20 seconds, you said, wasn't it? Cause... 20, yeah, 28 seconds. He, uh, he he bagged, so that was a quick win. I saw the video you posted as well. I didn't actually notice it at the time when Quandre Diggs got that pick straight away and then Daryl Taylor just runs on the pitch as an extra player and starts yeah, blocking to help him. I have absolutely no he, idea. He like, started celebrating, which is fine and fair, but then he kind of looked around, realised the play was still ongoing and decided to get stuck in. What the fuck has gone through his head in that moment? Has he forgot in that three seconds that he's on the pitch because he ran onto the pitch and not he was on the pitch because he was part of the play? I can't explain it, but yeah, it was a weird one, that. I have no idea. Made me chuckle when I saw it regardless, and it worked in our favour, so I'm happy with that. Um, Ipswich also won against Buxton, and the Dolphins got a pretty standard win, although the Texans did look like they were fighting back towards the end, and I think there's just something that the Texans seem to have been doing lately within fourth quarters where they just start to, to provide a little bit of a comeback, but the game's already over by then. Do you think it's just garbage time and the opposition's about done? Yeah, part of that as well, too, went off injured, was replaced by the rookie Skyler Thompson, I think it is, and, and that was when Texans started to come back into it because Dolphins weren't really doing much offensively. Maybe they took the foot off the gas a little bit, but yeah, definitely having that rookie quarterback made a difference if two was still in the game. I imagine they would have put even more points on the board, but yeah, it, they won in the end, which was the most important thing. Yep, we'll move on to Sam. Four out of six, sorry, four no. out of five. We, we, we're classing the name I want as null and void, aren't we? 
I think so. I think that's only fair, isn't it? Yeah, you missed it's, the game. Uh, three, now yeah. I'm quite proud of me. Yeah, my shouts this week. Who did I have? Let's let's go through it. Who did I have? Um, I failed on the Wales. I had a lock on Wales to beat Iran, didn't I? That was uh, hindsight, quite poor. <laughs> but then now uh, Senegal to get at least a point versus Holland. I'll take that. Ecuador. Ecuador. Ecuador, of course it was, wasn't it? I've, I've even wrote Senegal down. I'm no serious. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, and then, well, else did I back? You'd have to tell me. Oh, Browns uh, and Eckler. Yeah, Eckler received, it got a receiving touchdown, so that, uh, that counted. A lot was Chiefs to beat the Rams. But yeah, as I say, my upset was the Browns to beat the Bucks. A game of the week was Packers Eagles, which I, I don't think is a bad shout at all. Seven touchdowns in first half. So, yeah, I was quite happy with my pick so far this week. Just, uh, just the Wales one let me down. That's a great Sheep shout. bastards. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what I went for for what my game of the week was. I haven't written that one down. Skin, you normally write these down. No, not game nope. because great. game of the week is subjective in it. Whereas yeah, the others is like, so I've, I've not wrote, I've not written them uh, predictions down and. I can't remember what you went for, to be perfectly yeah. honest with you. Me neither. When we went to Kemp then, with his very I did well this week, valiant yeah. effort. Well, you Oops. absolute bastard, leaving him till the end, by the way. I'll tell you, though, I'll tell you what, though, on that subjective question, and Dawson rins me for this, how good were that Jags-Ravens game didn't end? No, mate, it was, and, and very this good. is where I said we'll come back to that, because I will put it out there, and I will put it on record, that halfway through the game, I did, did give Kemp a bit of shit, for the very, I think it was like 12-10 going into it the We're looking quarter. good for me, to be fair. No, it wasn't looking good for it being game of the week, but, you, you know, what we can finish. only go on the final scoreboard. Yeah, we can only go on the game as a whole, and that fourth quarter was very entertaining. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll step back. I'll apologise for calling you out mid-game, and next Thank time you, I'll wait until the uh, clock hits zero that's before it. I comment on that's you know, it. whether scoreboard. I think it's going to be right or not. And I, th- and, I think, and I think that's it for my predictions this week, isn't it? I think we've I think it was everything. just the one. Yeah. Well, that's not even. That's not no, even that was his prediction. Yeah, his prediction was the Cowboys to win. Did he get right? It was his lock, wasn't it? Yeah. His lock was the Cowboys to win. That's well, the one he got correct. Happen, but everything else, let's, yeah, let's I'll quickly forget about that one, I think. <laughs> I was in the, shout out to myself in glory. On, on Kemp's game of the week, by the way, shout out to Doug Peterson going for it on uh, Doug Pedersen, should I say, um, going for it on uh, two points to win the game. Cool Takes shit balls, like that. It? Takes balls, like that. Yeah, it's class. Um, and then my predictions finished five out of six. France and oh, Bills look on at the him. Lactic. Really oh, smug. Oh, I could forgot just to hear the man. smile on his face, could yeah, you? Yeah, could you? Yeah, you're smiling at Ag. <laughs> you are sorry? <laughs> what, you're smiling at Ag? The fact that I've, I've finished first look for a at change. Him, like, yeah. idiot, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> Ag is having a big wank tonight looking at that notepad. Go on, boys. <laughs> um, France and Bills um, were the lock teams that I got correct. The Thank only one that means. I actually didn't get correct was Drew to score for France. It was Mbappe that scored both goals. Miles yeah. Sanders got a touchdown. Um, Iran won with the, the wild card against Wales and the big Panthers shout, yeah. beat the Broncos 23-10. Even bigger shout that. Yeah, you've smashed your wild cards, mate. Yeah, yeah they're, they're very good. Part there, Ag. I'm going to be fair, though. I, I didn't actually intend to go for the Panthers on the first attempt, but I'll I'll take it in the end. I, so thank I, you I took much. Patriots, didn't I? So. Yeah, I went for Patriots, and you're obsessed with going for them, so I'll let you take that one. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you very much, mate. Well done. So at the time of recording, we do still have one game left of Week 12 fixtures. That is the Pittsburgh Steelers at the Indiana- Indianapolis Colts, should I say. Very entertaining game from the sounds of it, I'm sure. We'll start with the. Uh... <laughs> no, that was, that, was, say, that was my attempt off? of sarcasm. So... No, I, it came through. Like, it yeah, come it, through. it came good. through. Right, right. What a fucking dead game to end the week on. But anyway, sorry, I'll give you going to first. Well, I'll go to you first, mate, seeing as you, you've kind of taken the torch. Um, it's a fucking dead game, mate. Uh, I have actually, though, I, I have got an interest in this because I'm currently six points behind in my fantasy game this week. Uh, six point. 6.62 to be exact. Um, I have got Pittman to play and they have got Najee Harris to play. So if I just had Pittman to play, I'd, I'd have a decent chance. Harris should cover, you know, cover what Pittman gets though, plus that six point lead. So I've got a bit of an investment in it. I will be eagerly checking the result in the morning and the box score to see how both of those perform. But staying up for it, yeah. <laughs> oh yes mate <laughs> absolutely not uh, I know we've spoken a lot about the Thursday night football games but for the most part Monday night football has been relatively entertaining and good matchups but that's mm. certainly not the case to close off this week uh, it's, a, it's a pretty dead game by two poor teams so expect at least 48 points and a, and a great shootout Sam what about you mate terrible 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 game I've got uh, got no 
Uh, look for this. Uh, it was at quarterback for the Steelers. It's pick pick it, Kenny, pick it. Pick I've it. just realised I didn't give a prediction on who I think I will win. Um, TJ Watt plays, so he helps Steelers get the win. Sorry, Sam, carry on. That's all right. Well, I will go the Colts. Um, my man JT, I think he's going to pick it up a bit, and I might just see, see him through the line. Fair enough. Kemp? I'm going to go Colts as well. I think they are very, very uninspired on offence, but on defence, I think I, I, I think I might have seen it earlier that the fourth ranked defense in the league, and I think with with Pickett at quarterback for the Steelers, I, I can't see him. I can't see him doing much in there. I think he's had three touchdowns and eight interceptions, you know, in in so far this season. I think I, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's not great reading. It's not great starts. He's not the one. So I think the Colts are going to come out with it. And your betting field. If you want, send me by the sea. That is that semi is that James Blunt or Daniel That's Blunt. James Blunt, isn't is it? it? Daniel Bedenfield, if you're not the one. So am I one out of seven there then for Daniel Bedenfield? Yeah. Oh, it's bad, mate. Add it to the list. Add it to the nightmare. The ever growing yeah. list. One out of eight. Ever growing yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's not great. <laughs> I'm gonna... documenting all these to be able to be listened to forever. Oh no, that's fine. I'll take it because I'm very own Skip Bayless. But <laughs> one day, one day they'll they'll come true, and uh, yeah. I'll I'll look like a king. What a redemption arc that would be. Oh, 100%. The best. I'm going to split the opinions between us. I'm going to go with the Steelers. But like you say, with the amount of passing, I think it's just going to be a run-heavy game. And I think TJ Watt's just going to be the difference maker and stop Jonathan Taylor from really getting too much success from rushing the ball. So I'm going to say Najee Harris is going to carry the Steelers to a victory. So, as always... Fans on Facebook, Loaded Sport. There's also the community forum as well, Loaded Sport Community Forum, and just request to join. Twitter, at Loaded Sport. Instagram, at Loaded underscore, uh, underscore. Try that again. Instagram, at Loaded underscore Sport. And to listen to our content, including this episode, just go to YouTube or Spotify, search for Loaded Sport, and follow, subscribe, and leave reviews as well, which would be very helpful to help continue our already positive growth. Adam? I'll let you uh, finish off with the question of the week to Sam. So, Sam, when you've had a shit, do you put your hand <laughs> around the side to wipe your ass or between the legs? Neither. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>